do you use rock physics and geomechanics? Yeah, Powerful we do. Powerful tools. Okay. Okay. So as soon as you are ready, Sarah, I will start. I have a message that says recording has started. Other people should okay. have that Okay. So we try. <laughs> Let's see if it works. Uh, okay, so uh, tonight I want to yes, talk a little bit from my uh, personal background and uh, this talk was originally intended so two years ago or three years ago I, I applied as a, as a professor in, in uh, geothermal energy at a small university in, in uh, southeastern Germany in Bavaria and they asked me to give two presentations, one that I still have to translate for you, so this is about near surface, geo, uh, near, near surface geothermal energy. Um, and then a second one, which I was allowed to make in English and which was I was free to, to choose. So now, uh, though I chose my, yeah, my my favorite subject, geomechanics, rock physics, and things like that, uh, and um, its relation to um, um, to geothermal energy or its use for geothermal projects. Um, and that's what I'm I want to present to you tonight. Um, and yes, uh, you see, though it's it's not. It's not outdated, but it's not from today. It's, as you can see from uh, from the oops, let's see from the um, yes the, the two companies, the university and company uh, I'm presenting. So that's my former employer, Gesteinslabor, Dr. Ebert Jan. So that's basically Gesteinslabor in German means rock lab. So this uh, lab does uh, rock physical investigations, rock mechanical investigations, geomechanics, and so on for oil and gas, but for also for geothermal projects. And that was the university, the uh, Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, Nuremberg, uh, where I worked uh, at the same time. So, and so the topic is, uh, yes, geomechanics and its relation to, uh, um, to uh, geothermal projects. And uh, uh, Hans-Jörg Baumgartner, he's the laboratory chief, uh, uh, at Gestein's Labor, so and my former boss at Gestein's Labor, Ebert Jans, she's also co author. Marion Kemlein, she was then a PhD student at Erlangen University and uh, uh, was, um, yes, working on a project which I will uh, characterize shortly uh, in South uh, Eastern Germany. The same for Lars Scharfenberg, he now is at the University of Vienna. And um, the godmother of my lovely daughters, Helga de Waal, she's, um, yes, she was a professor at that time in, in Erlangen and uh, basically the head of uh, Marion and Lars. So that is all about, you have to know all about my co-authors. Okay, so let's jump in medias res, in the, the, the center of the things. And what I show you here is, is basically the, the most important tool we, we know from for rock mechanics, a triaxial cell. A triaxial cell consists, of course, of, of a container. So what I uh, show you here, a container where you can put in a, a, a pressure. I hope my terrible head with some experience with oil. And with this oil, we build up um, confining pressure so that the sample, the sample is here, Illustrated, so that is very principally the sample. Sample, um, and this sample is put into a hose, as you can see, or a sleeve, or consisting very often of a um, um, of a kind of um, plastic or whatsoever. You see this material, and um, with the pressure we build up, a, with this oil we build up a pressure which uh, simulates basically the, the in situ conditions, the conditions under which we want to test the rock. And testing the rock means uh, we want to destroy it. So we want to form a, a fracture here. And this we do by applying an axial load. And the axial load we apply from here. Okay, and here we have a counterweight basically. So we can measure the, the, the with this, uh, um, Pressure device, pressure vessel, we can test the, the force and the stress finally, which we have to apply to um, to, to destroy or to, to break the rock, to, to cause failure. So the, the actual or the SV uh, stress or force uh, is the one we apply for, for fracture formation and SH is the confining pressure which uh, uh, yes, confines and, and stabilizes the sample basically. Okay, 
So I hope that's all right for you. We can have later questions, of course. And now I want to show you an example for yes, so for what is happening. That's one of the tests that I'm going to, 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 show, to show to you in detail. But uh, the, the video I'm going to show to you is basically about uh, a noise or the sound which appears when the rock breaks. And we are testing here in this. Um, I hope the video doesn't start immediately with here in this pressure vessel apparatus, which uh, is able to, to build a, a force of 1,500 kilonewton, but it's quite a lot. Uh, is able to, to break a granite under a confining pressure, in this case of some 10 to 20 megapascals or so. And okay, there's a little bit, uh, yeah, talking in, in, in German, but the important thing is the sound. I'm, I'm just starting the, the video right now and might translate some things. So I hope it starts now. Let's see. So, okay, video starts. Okay, so behind me, you see your uh, uh, um, um, yeah the, the machine which we use to to build up the pressure so the uh, pressure producer basically which uh, has some uh, some tubing which goes to the the main machine where the the, the sample is, is situated so and uh, I'm sitting here at the control unit and you see uh, a screen and, and this the screen shows several curves and. Uh, uh, you might see an orange line. This shows how the uh, how the force increases while the strain on the x-axis also uh, increases. Actually, on the on the, on the x-axis we have time, so the strain is the the, the 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 green line down here. So what we see is that the sample is shortening, so the line is going down. So did you hear the sound? So this was. Uh, we do not hear the sound, Carla. Pardon? There is no sound. Okay. Okay, there's no sound. Okay, sorry. Okay, that's a bit of pity, but it was very, very, very noisy. So it was really bang like that. So the, the sound uh, the rock would also make when it, an earthquake would occur, and the it went down from from five thousand uh, uh, kilonewton down to fifty within a, 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 only a second. So okay, sorry that the sound didn't work. But okay, at least we, we you saw the video, and I try to show you now also what happens when I go just one slide back. So no. okay, so with the next slide, I, I try to show you what happened while the the rock was breaking in the video. So let's go here. So when you see the the, the sample to the left, and the numbers refer to what is happening here along this curve and I will go through this step by step. So what we see is we, we compress the sample and it's, it's of course quite uh, exaggerated. So we see we have already seen the failure. I will go back once so you can see that better. So that's just okay. Okay. See so we, we compress in the x direction or along the long axis of the, the rock come to this point where we measure Young's modulus, continue with the deformation, and then we measure the residual strength, can do another hysteresis to, to measure another elastic or pseudo-elastic property, basically, and that's what we do. And the, the sound you unfortunately didn't hear, um, yes, happens when, when failure occurs. So that is basically what a big important or the is an important part of, of rock mechanical investigations is. So we um, we while we deform the the plug or the, the rock sample, the cylindrical sample, we increase of course the strain. That's what you have seen when the when the uh, when the plug was was shortening and getting a barrel barrel shape. Basically, what was of course exaggerated, but in principle that happens in the, during the elastic part of the of the journey towards failure. And then we measure at the same time, we measure the axial strain. And so there's a shortening in the, along the x-axis, or the, the long axis. And we measure at the same time the, the increase in, in, in um, or the, the, the increase in, in, the, in the radial direction. So the, the, the thickening in the radial direction along here. And so the, the measures we, we get, the important numbers we get from this, which are also important later for, for geomechanic uh, model and geomechanic interpretation, 
are basically the, 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 the peak strengths where failure occurs. Then we get a residual strength. So what describes um, yes, the, the steady state movement basically on the, on the uh, failure plane which has occurred. Um, and then we get also some elastic properties, which could tell us something about <clears throat> yes, the, the elastic or the, the pre-failure behavior of the, of, the, of the elastic strength, basically, or the stiffness, we could say. That is, first of all, there's a Young's modulus, which we get from this hysteresis. So during the hysteresis, we decrease first the, um, the stress, the actual stress, of course, and also the elastic part of the, of the strain is, is rebuilt. Or, and then we increase it again, and hopefully we get to the point where we start our hysteresis so that, that proves that we really have, uh, have made this test under um, elastic conditions. And on the other side, uh, we measure the, the, the thickening along the radius and uh, the ratio between both, between this uh, slope and this slope, or this slope better on this slope, we, is finally our Poisson ratio, which tells us something about the stiffness as well. So the, the lower the Poisson ratio, um, uh, uh, the less um, shortening we get along the long axis, and uh, the, the stiffer the rock is, and the higher the, the Young's modulus, the stiffer as well. So usually we get Poisson ratios between, yes, uh, something of 0 0.01 to 0 0.5, and you can say a shale or so would have a Poisson ratio in the range of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and a granite which we tested in the, in the video before, um, has a Poisson's ratio of maybe 0.1 or something like that. But I will show you examples of that. So that's yeah what we basically did in the, in the test before and with, with this triaxial uh, testing device, which I've shown in the first slide. Okay, and what we, uh, we, we get from that is basically um, this line. So this, this failure line here. So this straight we want to determine. We term it determined as a, as a tangent on this circle, and this circle was developed by a German engineer, um, Mr. Moore, and Mr. Coulomb then made it a, a failure criterion where he, he described simply, and that's a very elegant way, that you have a confining pressure, which you build, which we built up with this uh, oil, this, this uh, pressure vessel, and then we uh, increase step by step the um, it goes just two slides back. Then we increase the vertical stress, the actual load, and that is over S, S1 here. So what we do step by step in an incremental way, so we start here with a very small differential stress, so differential because the difference between our sigma 1 and sigma 3, and we increase that step by step. And then finally, we come to the point where this Moore circle touches the, the failure line or the regression, the, the failure beam, shear, shear stress beam, um, and, uh, and the, the rock breaks. That defines failure, basically. And then when we um, have the, the fault or the, the, the uh, uh, the, the, the fault formed, then we can have further movement along this failure plane, and um, this will then define our residual strengths. And this is also called the Amontant um, Amontant criterion. But that only, by the way, but those are two things: residual strength and peak strength. Are quite important also for the rest of the talk. Okay, in some cases, and um, um, this is particularly true for, for, for oil and gas industry, where we have uh, drill cores uh, only rarely uh, preserved, and uh, most uh, wells are not not cored. So we have maybe I don't know 1,500 meters of, uh, of of drilling, and only 10 or 15 meters of core, or even less. So we have to be really very careful with these with this uh, precious material, and so therefore we cannot do uh, too many uh, rock physical tests or strength tests uh, with the core material that we have. So what we have to do is we have to take one sample and have to use it for for several steps of the test. And if I just go back to this slide, so there you see a single 
stress. So we increase our uh, axial stress and we, 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 def we deform, we, we, we cause strain to our sample and we make failure. But because we only have do not have so much material, we very often do so-called multi-stage testing. So we uh, start deforming our sample and then when we see that um, uh, that the the stress strain curve starts to bend. Then we increase the confining pressure and stabilize the, um, the sample by that uh, by that measure, and uh, assume that at this point the rock would have almost broken. So we would have a, a peak strength one here, although we don't allow. The rock to break, but we assume that it's close to to failure. Then we we increase the confining pressure, so we really make the uh, give it a, a, a stronger corset basically to to our um, to our um, plug, so that it can can withstand a higher axial stress until we see okay here it is again close to close to failure. So we get a peak strength two. And this we do oops, two. And this we do for further steps until at, uh, at, five, at step five we say okay now we are ready for we are ready to to allow the rock really to fail. So we can construct from one sample now only one more circle. We can construct a whole bunch of them, five in this case, and that's what I'm going to show to you now here. And this. Is uh, idealized example. So we have a first. So this would be our peak strength one here. This would be peak strength two at a higher confining pressure. This would be peak strength three at an even higher confining pressure. Peak strength four and five. <clears throat> and this allows now to to build yes uh, a more complex pattern of this uh, entire. Um, um, yes, uh, shear straight or, or failure beam or whatsoever. So we, you see, the if, if I would continue with my uh, tangent, it works for the first three more surface. It doesn't work, so we have to form a second one, which looks like that. And this is uh, something uh, already uh, um, observed by by, uh, by uh, geomechanics. Called Bayerly, who, who said, "Okay, with the confining pressure, with this increasing confining pressure, a rock starts to uh, um, get into a steady state, and a kind of creep is starting to to uh, to develop. So the, and the, and the, the this uh, has as consequence that the uh, shear beam or failure line gets flatter, basically. So and this allows to to define our uh, rock mechanical behavior uh, in a more proper way." Um, we would only go have the first three of these circles. So we get a really good picture from this multi-stage test or from five single-stage tests in case we really have enough um, material than only having one or two more circles. So that is basically the theory behind all that. And now go into the two projects which we were investigating. So one is from the Bavarian forces. The map of Germany, you see. So here's the uh, Czech Republic, basically, and uh, here in this area is the <clears throat> area of interest, so which consists basically of uh, um, um, yes, crystalline rocks, gneisses, uh, granites, and so on. Nowadays, also an area of interest for as nuclear waste dis uh, disposal sites, although there's not yet as, nothing is yet decided. And we investigated uh, five granites from, the, from this area. And the, the reason why we investigated granites is because these granites um, produce some uh, radiogenic heat. And this radiogenic heat might be enough um, to be a source for uh, geothermal energy. And the same is true for this area here, six, seven, but it's not, not part of the, this uh, basement um, uh, outcrop area, Bavarian forest. But it's part of the Franconian base uh, basin. But there is also an, an, a, a geothermal anomaly. We have some spars there, and um, we were also interested in, in having an, a look at 
uh, at this area. And I will um, just present that in detail quite soon. But first, we want to have a look at the heat production of these um, yes, points one to five, these uh, Bavarian forest granites. And what is plotted here are the different lithologies. So uh, yes, from different, okay, they have funny names, Halzenberg granite, they are called Salzenburg granite, Eberhardsreuth granite, Titling granite, you name it. And then here on the, on the, on the y-axis, we have basically is the heat production. So you see, we have a uh, uh, lot of them uh, produce a lot of heat. They are low, low heat producing granites for most of them, but, but some of them, in particular the Salzenburg granite, which is basically, oops, I want to go back, which is basically this one, this little guy here, uh, is in an area of, of medium. And if you look at the, the, the okay, error margin, and it's even up to high heat producing um, um, granite. And this could be uh, a good source for, uh, for a geothermal project, even a, a power producing project. Okay, so that's the area of interest number one. <clears throat> the other area of interest is just to the just to the west of, of this uh, uh, basement, these basement rocks. So the the basement, just try to uh, map it here. So the the rim of the basement would be about here. So this blue line. So this would be north of the Bavarian forest. But then we have here this. Uh, I give it uh, which which color to choose? Maybe white. So this here, this is a geothermal anomaly. And um, here is a, a yes, a kind of stratigraphic column from zero to 1,020 meters. And there's a um, plot against temperature. And you see the, the, the black, the normal geothermal gradient of 30 degrees per kilometer um, um, is uh, overcome. Quite a lot. So we have temperatures of up to um, 65 degrees and 1,200 meters, in particular here in this Mürsbach. Where uh, we'll give it a try to uh, encircle it. So that's the yeah, that is really the, the center of this uh, anomaly. But we had very good um, core material from this Obernsees well at the southeastern rim of this anomaly and that's the the second um yeah um sample set we investigated so these samples number six and seven in the map before and just go back so here those two come from that's our anomaly basically in the franconian basin okay now you're probably eager to see the the rocks in 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 question, but before uh, an idea, how does uh, the um, radiogenic heat production work, and uh, what uh, what else do we need? So we have a, a heat source. Those are the granites. So here they are exposed in the uh, this basement area, Bavarian forest, and to the north it's the so-called Fichtelgebirge. <clears throat> and then we have here in the Franconian basement, we assume at least maybe a, a, a buried granitic body. And this is disseminating radiogenic heat. And then you have some deep reaching fault systems. And um, these fault systems are, of course, also pathways for, um, for meteoric water. And this water is then heated up due to the radiogenic heat. So we have not a petrothermal system in this case, but a, but a hydrothermal system. So the water is uh, heated up and uh, can, can rise again along some other fractures and this is maybe the case in the, in the, in the Mürsbach area where we were able really to, to reach the 65 degrees and 1200 meters and <clears throat> the, the, the urban seas would maybe be more in, in such a position where we have a well which is some 1300 meters deep and goes really down into the into the basement rocks, so which are basically those here, the, the, the orange ones. And here you reach temperatures also of some 40 degrees at least. So that's the hypothesis we, we followed and those are the rocks we investigated. So uh, here we have the, the um, basement rocks. So first of all, the rocks from the Bavarian forest. So we call them Bavarian forest granite. In general, 
And then we have from this Oban Zeus well from the Franconian basin. Car Carlo. Two rocks. Yeah. Yes, excuse, sure. Excuse me, question. So with all this geomechanics work, um, this will help us understand where we can do hydrofracking. Uh, this will help us to do uh, where we can do hydrofracking, and it helps us, of course, to to know some to to learn about the stability of our borehole. Um, and yeah, the, those are the two uh, most important assumptions. And it gives us, and it will show you some more basic things uh, about the reduction of stability fields uh, due to um, yes. Um, or activation or react newly activation or reactivation of falls and things like that. So those are always okay because when we do fracking, we hopefully create new 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 pathways and new pathways mean always new fractures and new fractures mean uh, yes loss of stability and that's something I, I want to show and where we have to be careful. So but this will be the the, the final outcome of the talk. Okay. So at this point, uh, I just want to present the, the, the specimens we were in, in investigating. So we have from this uh, Franconian basin. Um, or does it answer your question, basically? Pardon? Alex, did that answer your question? I hope so. Yeah, yeah, I did. Thank you. OK, 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 OK. We, we have time for, 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 for questions later, I guess, as well. OK, so this is a, a meta sandstone. Uh, from this uh, yes basement just the top of this the, these granites which we observed there so very dense so therefore I didn't put any any porosities because they are so dense they have basically as the granite zero porosity and even this um, sedimentary rock this this Permian sandstone has a very low porosity of 5.6 percent so this <clears throat> is already from its porosity maybe not so interesting for any uh, hydrothermal project but those two could be interesting for an enhanced geothermal system, so for, for a hot dry rock project or something like that. Okay, so what we did now, and those are the, the, the graphs I've shown you already in a textbook manner, so we did some triaxial testing on, on those rocks, and uh, here are uh, three curves, or so three types of curves for these three different rock types. In blue, we have the, the granite from the Bavarian forest, so the, the deepest and strongest rock, basically. Then we have this meta sandstone, so in uh, this stuff here in um, in lilac, and then the weakest rock, of course, is the sandstone. Yeah, as you can see. And we all these tests, we did several tests to produce a very nice Mokulong uh, analysis. But the, these are for comparability uh, are curves at a confining pressure of some 10 to 20 megapascals. And you see, of course, the the granite is much much stronger. With a, the, the peak strength of some 350 megapascal, while the um, um, yes, the um, so the sandstone, the Permian one, has a, only 100 megapascal. Somewhere in between, although even quite strong, is this meta sandstone. Okay, and if we translate this now, okay, maybe interesting as well because I want to talk about this. So we have those points are interesting, and here this plateau, which defines the residual strength of these rocks as well. So we am going to compare the data now in, in a more Coulomb diagram. And I hope that is not too confusing. So in blue we have now here the, the, the granite itself. So uh, with a yes uh, at, at the highest confining pressure of maybe some some uh, 35 megapascal confining pressure we reach a, a strength of 550 megapascal. That's really quite a lot and uh, even at lower confining pressure it's really still very, very strong. So we get a very steep um, failure line. So in a high uh, uh, high friction angle and so on and so on. All data which are later on important and which are written here. So we have here those are two, two, the two important two important values: the cohesion of the rock and the, and the shear angle, uh, or the, the friction angle. It's very high for the granite and quite low for the for this sandstone and somewhere in between the um, the matter sandstone. And if you look now at the same graph, but under residual conditions, so the rock is already broken and it's now sliding on the fracture plane, just for comparison. So this graph goes down to uh, up to 550 megapascal 
And here we're only at 270 megapascals. So only uh, after failure, the rock is only half as strong as before. And unfortunately for the um, Permian sandstone, uh, we were not allowed by the uh, by the customer to uh, to make it really several measurements. So we do, didn't get a, a more Coulomb analysis under residual conditions. But we have it at least for the meta sandstone and for the for the granite. And you see under residual conditions. The meta sandstone is not uh, not very much weaker as uh, the comparable granite. Although, as you later will see, um, the the stability fields for yes so for possible earthquake activity are quite different. But that's another story. Okay, well, those are now the important parameters, and I've listed them here. And I think we we have also the um, the chart in our folder, so you can have a look later on those. But maybe. Um, yeah, some important numbers to, to compare. So if you look at numbers under uh, peak conditions, so before failure and after failure, for example, this uh, fracture or this uh, uh, friction angle, then you see that this really decreases dramatically for the, for the granite. And we have uh, investigated several granites. So that's actually the one we have uh, had a look at, but we had uh, five more of them. And we build an average granite. So this is then our, our, our model data. You see how, how dramatically the, the shear angle or the, the uh, friction angle uh, changes. The same also for the strength. So that's the peak strength, uh, the residual strength. It is uh, not as dramatic for the meta sandstone, but still quite a big difference. And also the, the shear angle or the, the friction angle is not as. Uh, as dramatic in uh, in uh, dec decreasing that dramatically as it is the case for for the granite. Okay, but those numbers are now important when we try to do a, a very a simple model, and that's basically the same more Coulomb graph I've shown you before. But what what we do is we we combine now our um, uh, rock mechanical data, so basically those we gain from here with some stress data and stress data is always a, <clears throat> a difficult topic. So in, in case of, of the Bavarian forest, there are almost none. So we have a lot of stress data in, in Central Europe for the Alps, for example. So there we have a world stress map and a lot of measurements there because there's also a lot of oil and gas activity, a lot of uh, drilling. We know from borehole breakouts uh, a lot about our uh, stress field there, but in the Bavarian forest, there's not so much <clears throat> drilling activity. So I had to go to a, 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 a water um, pump storage plant, and there they made some 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 wells and, and measured basically really <clears throat> with some hydrofrac uh, tests stresses, and they get at, at a very yeah low depth of only some 250 meters, uh, a minimum uh, stress of 4.4. Um, megapascal, although they don't know in which direction, and the vertical stress of 6.1 megapascal. So and from these values, if we extrapolate them to, to 1,000 meters, what is uh, the, the depth of interest in our case? So we get uh, a minimum stress of some 16 megapascal and a maximum stress of okay, 6 times 4, basically, of some 24 megapascals. And now we know from our um, from our um, investigations, from our triaxial testing, we know our um, uh, friction angle, and from that we can calculate the tangents, the uh, friction coefficient, and this we can now calculate uh, our shear strait at which we will have failure. So as soon as this shear strait touches our Mohr circle, we will have failure. So the entire area below this yeah, touching area will be safe. So in case um, we um, we want to be safe, we should not move this shear straight until here. So we would be safe with this material here and here and here. But as soon as we move in this direction and touch here, we are basically in danger. So and uh, and uh, to to shift this line. In this direction, we have to do have to increase our pore pressure. So the, the pressure, for example, uh, at which we frack. Yeah. So we would get fracturing at a pore pressure or reactivation of other older faults 
uh, at a pore pressure of, of 16 megapascal. So then we would reactivate falls. So this could be useful, yes, uh, while stimulating, but later on we should be careful when we run our power plant or geothermal power plant, not to, to run it with a pore, uh, to not with a, with a pore pressure of the fluid we run through the system of higher than 16 megapascals. So that's the thing we have to be careful with. Okay, and I will show you this and maybe uh, I don't want to get too deep into this, but um, um, yeah, this is a very nice method to, to describe the, the, the stresses, um, or the, the, yes, what, what the effect of stresses developed by, uh, by Max Sobeck. It's called the stress polygon or, um, uh, yeah, and it, it shows basically the, the fields of stability under several, um, um, tectonic conditions. So we have R for reverse faulting, so com compressive res regimes as in the Cordillera, for example, and the Alps. So this would be here, this area. Then we have strike slip in this area and normal faulting here. So and then when we have our, um, um, yes, our, our testing, and the testing defines basically our compressive failure constraint. Then we see when we have uh, peak conditions, so when the rock is not yet, uh, has, has not yet failed, or has not, has not yet it's broken, then these fields are for the Bavarian forest granites quite quite big, quite, quite large field for all three. And as soon as we reactivate falls or have, have failure on the falls happened, then this field gets really, really slow or small. So, and this is, yeah, this would be the condition under which we um, yeah, would initiate our, our stimulation. So we really would need to put a lot of, uh, yes, force or pore pressure in the system. So much more than 16, 16 megapascal for, re, for reactivation for older faults and to, to make new fractures open. Um, we would even need much more. So we really need, would need to, to get our, our minimum st stress of uh, all these 24 megapascals, but then after, reactiv uh, after reactivation of falls and, and uh, formation of new pathways, we have to be very careful not to reactivate and, uh, and to, to force earthquakes on, the, on these newly opened fractures. So this would be the condition during operation of our power plant. So and how does that look now for the, for the area which is maybe much more promising in this Franconian basin, where we have this meta sandstone, and there we made some uh, more sophisticated uh, stress measurements with the so-called RACOS method. Uh, RACOS means rock anisotropy strength on, on, on samples. Uh, a method developed by a, a, a fellow geophysician from, from Potsdam, close, close to Berlin. And this is a method where you use really uh, um, uh, uh, core material where you close microfractures with increasing confining pressure, measure simultaneously uh, um, uh, ultrasonic velocities, and from this measure, uh, you do this under uh, yes, uh, anisotropic conditions and, and in different directions, and you get basically a, a tensor for ultrasonic velocities. From that, you can calculate uh, a stress tensor, a 3D uh, a second order stress tensor, which gives you really stress in three directions, a real three 3D stress analysis. And that's what you see here. So with the direction and the magnitude of the stresses. So the maximum uh, stress would be more or less in northwesterly direction with a strength with a, a magnitude of 45.8. And the, the least principal stress would be here with some 20.4 <clears throat> in, in the uh, uh, southwesterly direction, all not very um, yes, not, not basically not horizontally, but we will do later on. But, but with these values, with this maximum and minimum uh, principal stress, we can now also do the same calculation which we did before for the Bavarian forest granites. So now we know uh, the uh, um, shearing conditions. We know now our, our, our friction angle, which is on 28 degrees. So we get this uh, shear straight which shows that we would have at uh, 6 megapascal pore pressure already a reactivation <clears throat> of faults under these conditions, and we would have to go up to 21 megapascals basically to, to, um, to generate new, new fractures and to, to stimulate our reservoir. So and if we do the same uh, stress polygon 
under the same conditions uh, for our um, sex ring and metastasis. Then you see from the beginning the scale is the same as with the uh, Bavarian forest granite that the stability field is already much smaller from the beginning, so that we have to be much, much more careful when, when stimulating and when you then have a new fracture network formed, that the uh, stability field is even smaller. So this compressive failure constraint has moved even further down. And then we really have to run it really at a much smaller um, pore pressure, the entire system of only six megapascals compared to the 16 megapascals in the Bavarian forest. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to tell you about yeah, how rock physics and geomechanics um, yeah, can help for geothermal projects. And I want to just give you some take-home messages. Of course, you can take the entire presentation home and, and reread it. Okay, first of all, some um, um, uh, regional geological messages. So both areas have some ge geothermal potential. The Franconian Basin probably more because we know more of this there um, as a Bavarian forest, but even the Bavarian forest, uh, these granites can be really uh, useful geothermal heat sources. And the other rock, this uh, sedimentary rock, uh, due to its low porosity, doesn't have a big value as, um, as an attractive geothermal reservoir. Okay. And um, yeah, then of course we, we want to stimulate our, our reservoir and uh, have to know for this reason some of the important rock physical characteristics as strength and Young's modulus and so on and so on, uh, and the stress field as well. And as soon as we know those, we can calculate, of course, um, what will happen when we stimulate. And uh, we see that the presence of faults decreases the strength of the all these rock bodies dramatically, as you have seen in particular from these uh, uh, stress polygons. And um, all our investigations uh, serve really as powerful tools to, to make geothermal reservoirs possible and to make them safe. And that's also very important, I think, in particular, to gain acceptance by the, by the public for such projects. Okay, that's what I want to present to you. The floor is open for discussion basically okay i i have one comment and one question yeah sure uh one comment so can we conclude that geomechanics is helps us identify the risk and how to mitigate these risks in the formation exactly yeah that's that's the main point of it yeah okay <clears throat> okay first of all the geomechanics was okay Okay, and invented it was yeah for, for several reasons for, for 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 tunneling and so on and so on for safety there. But its first use in uh, in all yes uh, underground reservoir uh, exploration was really for 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 borehole safety um, to not destroy a reservoir by uh, by collapse of boreholes. And therefore, you okay the you probably are familiar with, with the mud weight problem um, and um, for, for the, the the mud weight problem. Or the, the, to, to the definition of the mud window is basically always a, a geomechanic problem. So you have to, to find uh, uh, the, the balance between the, the pore pressure and the, um, and the minimum uh, horizontal stress. So the, the, your, your mud has to be uh, yeah, heavy enough to, uh, uh, to prevent uh, the, uh, to, to, to be higher than the pore pressure so that you don't get too much fluid flowing while drilling into the into the borehole, and on the other hand, it doesn't have Hello? You are really at that point, um, here at this, this point where, yes, oops, let's get back there, at that point where you would generate fractures and reactivate fractures and uh, make damage to the reservoir. So that's true not only for geothermal projects, but it's also pro uh, true for any oil and gas project. But of course, in, 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 in terms of, of geomechanical uh, geothermal projects, and in particular um, enhancing of uh, geo, uh, geothermal systems, uh, hot dry rock systems, uh, you have to be careful uh, not to uh, 
cause a too high micro seismicity or even a, a macro seismicity in the end. And that's something you find out with uh, geomechanic investigations. And with a combination of both, with this triaxial testing, which gives you the, the important uh, rock physical numbers, uh, and with stress measurement, either by this uh, uh, Ray method, so with these, uh, um, with these uh, yes, beach ball or stereo plot, plots, which indicate the direction or the magnitude of the of the stresses from the from the uh, um, um, drill core itself, or by more classical techniques such as uh, uh, hydrofrac uh, testing and uh, borehole breakouts and world stress map and things like that. Yeah, so those are data you need for. Uh, uh, easy or more more advanced uh, geomechanical model. Yes. Yeah. So, Professor Carlo, did they apply yeah. geomechanics in Poyang, South uh, Korea? As you uh, know, I I <laughs> don't know the exact case. Uh, I think, um, it, well, in I think in 2017. There was a geothermal uh, project in Poyang, South uh, Korea, and uh, there was a result, 5.5 um, .5 on the Richter scale, I think, uh, of an um, earthquake, and they pointed it mm -hmm. to the geothermal project that had caused that. So I wonder if geomechanics was done prior to the, to the project starting. And and therefore, if it has, then they would have mitigated, minimi minimized, or avoided that risk of crossing over a fault. It, it would have mitigated. So I, I don't know if they if they did it or if they did it properly. And it, it's always complicated. Of course, there are so many parameters which which go into the calculation, and you can never be sure that you are really on the, the safe side. And nowadays, I think most uh, uh, drilling projects do geomechanics but the question is uh, always how, how well do you know your, your stress field and which changes do you do to the stress field and of course as soon as you uh, start frag you, I, I think you, you have to do stress measurement and that's the the, the most important thing uh, continuously so as, as soon as you did some fracking uh, you change the stress field of course because you uh, um, you, you allow um, yeah movements and motions on on newly uh, uh, driven fractures and and this uh, has an influence on on how how stress is distributed on a, on a very local scale and uh, that's something you cannot always uh, control and uh, then of course such a project can also go the wrong way yeah. but 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 you have to do it really continuously and on a as small scale as possible. So uh, as many stress measure measurements as possible, as you have seen. So I have uh, for this Franconian basin, okay, there are some more data because we have uh, uh, fault activity al along some of these um, bigger faults, which I can show you here in, in this slide again. So all these, all this faulting systems, so the this so-called Franconian line, this is very well, well understood and uh, um, there are a lot of, um, at least some um, um, stress data from there. And then we have the, the very famous uh, KTB, so the, the, the deepest straight hole, at least, uh, on Earth. So there's a, the Kola Peninsula uh, um, uh, well bore, so which is some 12,000 meters deep, but the, the, the really straight uh, uh, drill, core, uh, the, the drill hole is here in, in, in uh, the Oberpfalz, in this area with some 8,000 meters uh, depth. And there are also a lot of stress measurements done. So for this area, we, we know quite well. And then we did our Rakos measurements. So we have a good idea about stress. It's, it's much more complicated than for for this area. So there's not not so much interest in, in stresses in this region. Although we have also this uh, uh, fault system, what is the prolongation of this uh, um, uh, uh, Franconian line, so this uh, Bavarian Pfahl, but it's not as well understood and it was also not that active. Uh, so uh, that uh, there's not uh, too much known about uh, yes, stresses in this area. So there are two or three points in the entire area, so including also the uh, uh, yes, Mesozoic and Tertiary rocks, 
uh, to to the rest. But it's very very uh, not very well understood stress field in this area. This is the uh, yes the, the 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 main parameter basically. What you have to know on a very small scale. So that's important. And this might have uh, missed in the uh, in your Korean example. But, but for example, okay, that's not an example from uh, from geothermal, but the, the Groningen gas field in, in the Netherlands is about to close, and I think the, the, the biggest uh, gas field in Europe, and very well very well understood, but was always uh, uh, subject to to uh, really strong earthquake activity due to due to uh, extraction of the of the gas, and although it's really uh, a very prominent field and uh, really delivering a lot of gas. Uh, um, uh, the Netherlands probably have to, to shut it down because of the high earth reactivity. And although there's really a lot of not known about it, and um, uh, I think uh, the production process is very careful, they cannot uh, um, yes, uh, prevent it when things like that happen. And then there's this famous uh, geothermal project from Basel. So you may have heard about this earthquake from 13 something, 1300 something in Basel, so which was devastating, uh, and uh, the uh, the memory is still active, so people in Basel still know about this old earthquake, and then there was a, a geothermal project in the early 2000s, and this caused again some earthquake activity, not, not as strong as the Korean example, but also in the 3-4 area, and this caused the, um, the entire uh, Basel uh, geothermal project to be stopped. So. And in this case, uh, people did uh, know a lot about the stress field because Basel is in the Rhinegraben, so uh, very active. So it's in this German map here in this area. So st stresses are well known, well understood there, but still it happened. So and that's maybe one of the main risks with, with geothermal projects, but um, you never can prevent entirely, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I stop sharing the screen, I guess. Yes, that's okay for you. And return. Hey, Collins, there as well. Good seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Okay.